and obviously Alison, our partnership manager as well, who's doing this great work to put together today's agenda. So welcome everybody. Um, so first of all, we're just going to talk about a couple of practical bits and pieces, next dates and events and so on. Um, and then we've got uh, two main presentations today. We've got Chris from the Forestry Commission uh, talking to us. He's the carbon and water advisor there. And then we've got Louise from Natural England, who's the health lead for the Western Midlands. She's going to talk about the work she's doing. And then at the end, hopefully Richard will be joining us. I don't think he's in the room yet uh, from Leicester just, County Council. Just joined. Oh, has he? Great. OK. Yeah. Uh, for a roundtable discussion about biodiversity credits and biodiversity net gain. So, um, Alison, over to you for these first couple of slides then and some dates and welcome to new members. OK, thanks, James. So, um, yes, we've just had a, a flurry of new members over the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure who's in the room, but um, welcome to you if you are. Um, so if you want to move on to the next slide, James, we'll just be looking at a few dates and just wanted to let everybody know that all the links for booking webinars, for booking live events um, will all be, be sent to you in our newsletters, um, which come out frequently. Um, we'll be doing a special one later today with the new link for booking spaces at Leicester City. Um, that is slightly reduced compared to our normal capacity and that's because Leicester City is still um, operating on social distancing. So the room that we'll be using is is much reduced. Um, so it is first come first serve with the, the booking. Uh, James is going to put that link in the chat. Um, so please reserve your places if you um, would like to join us for that event. Um, we've got three presenters on that visit uh, talking about projects in and around Leicester City and of course a tour of Abbey Park um, and then all these events uh, that you can see through to May those will all be promoted on our uh, regular newsletter. Um, our mental health one is now fully booked. Um, we've managed to um, uh, squeeze a few more places in there with Lantra so that's absolutely great. Um, so lots more to come and um, if you've got any queries or any inquiries on anything just give me a call or drop me an email. OK, James. Yeah, so just to confirm that's the details of our next site meeting in person, hopefully at Leicester. So they've just put the link for that one in the chat. Um, so if anyone doesn't know, Abbey Park, right, right near the centre of Leicester, isn't it, Alison? That's a nice and easy one to get to, actually. Yeah, and on the newsletter, which I'll send out shortly, and on Eventbrite is all the parking information. Um, and if you want accessible parking, that can be arranged. So just let us know. Great. OK. And on the next slide, I've just just put that in. We have got um, the West Midlands Combined Authority Green Grants in our March webinar. But they are offering, and, and I'm guessing, sorry, East Midlands, this probably won't apply to you, um, but they are holding their own webinar on the 27th about the green grants. Um, so I haven't got any more information than that. But again, the link there um, that I'm sure James can again put in the chat. Yeah, I'll try that's, and open up for you. Yeah, that's the link to, um, to booking onto that uh, funding webinar. Let, let me just I'll stick that one in the chat now as well. OK. 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 OK, great. Thanks, Alison. Thanks for those. Thank and you. These are people to look forward to for the next few events there then. So our first speaker today, as I mentioned, is Chris Waterfield, who is the Carbon and Water Advisor from the Forestry Commission. And he's going to talk to us today about natural flood management. So, Chris, over to you and then just give me a nudge as you want your slides progressing. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm happy to uh, to come and talk. Uh, it seems to have been a long time in the planning. I think um, I must have talked to Alison in October or even September about um, about coming to um, to talk to you. And it's my great pleasure to be here. I'm going to give a very simple um, uh, description of what natural flood management is. And so I apologise if it is already stuff that you know. And I've just noticed that my first slide has just forestry. It should say Forestry Commission. There's obviously a blanked out bit across the um, the, the commission part of my um, of my slide there. But um, if you could put me onto the next slide, that would be superb. 
So you can't talk about natural flood management without talking about the water cycle. And I know that most people, anybody who's done geography O level or have studied it at all, probably even in infant school, um, will have learned about the water cycle. But um, it's it's really important that uh, we remind ourselves that um, what we're talking about is a natural process that um, that happens all the time. Um, I'm not going to try to uh, read off that water cycle pro um, uh, slide there, but you can see it, and I'm, I'm presuming that this um, will go to uh, to everybody afterwards. But um, you can see that, in fact. Even in that drawing, um, you can see that the trees and woodlands play an enormous part in the water cycle. Um, not only in what we now call slowing the flow, but also in um, evapotranspiration, infiltration, interception of water as it cycles through um, the water cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, we have been cycling faster. For the last 170 years um, since industrialization and the, the Industrial Revolution, which, um, you know, began, I guess, in, in Manchester and the Midlands, Midlands and Manchester, whichever way around you want to, uh, to put it, um, the, this uh, cycling of water and getting it from, um, from the clouds to industry and out again um, has um, has just speeded up. We've made it far um, easier for water to travel through our um, through our systems. We've built special um, channels for water to go down, and we use it in incredibly intensive ways. I did hear once. Um, a very long time ago, so this stat is probably wrong, but water that um, comes into the headlands of um, the Thames has gone through people seven times. That might be seven different people, it might be seven the same person, but it's gone through people seven times before it reaches the, um, the sea in the North Sea, which is quite some sort of stat if you think about it. And that is repeated, I imagine, across the country. That kind of constant half cycle of what the water cycle is through, um, you know, sort of industri industry, industrialization, through canals and channels and rivers and back into the system. And we've noticed um, all over the place, and you'll probably have heard it in the um, uh, in the news that our part treated or untreated water gets back into the system, um, which we don't, you know, we don't want to see. But that's not not what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so we've made this cycle very fast. What do we need to do now? Next slide, please. Well, we'll slow down the flow now, please. We'll start to make um, that water cycle work properly work and work a bit slower i have to say that natural flood management as it goes in works in small catchments and when i say small catchments i mean catchments that are about 100 or um, or less kilometers square that's still quite big um but it's uh, it's shown that the science shows that um you can see an appreciable difference from interventions such as the ones you can see in the um, uh, in the pictures there. If the catchments are small, when the catchments get larger, it's difficult to tell that the in, that, that the interventions you make have much effect on a larger catchment. But you can see it in a smaller catchment. And in, 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 in most instances, what you're talking about is a reduction of, of, of 5% in the peak flow. So 5% in the peak flow could be um, the difference between uh, storm waters overtopping a flood system, a flood defense system, 
or not. So it is important, but remember, I think this, well, the, the, the Environment Agency and the Forestry Commission both think that um, natural flood management through, you know, sort of nature-based solutions, and working with natural processes, um, should run alongside more conventional engineered solutions. We're not talking about this as being the panacea for all flooding or anything like that, but it is something that that can be done and it can be done in um, an urban setting as long as you're not putting um, at risk uh, any communities or infrastructure that are um, down or upstream of, of your interventions um, at, at risk of flooding that is. Next slide, please. So where do we want to get to? Um, and, and how can forests help? With, um, with natural flood management, I guess what we're trying to do is to, is to recreate some of the more natural processes that happen within um, a woodland. So um, woodlands, uh, have you know trees near rivers and those trees fall into the river and what normally happens is that 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 slows the flow of a river what we do with the um with these um built interventions is try to replicate that and what we're looking at doing is providing is trying to make well oxygenated water free of contamination woodlands um can help to reduce most contamination through um, phytoremediation, um, which is the uptake of um, nutrients through through um, plant plant based systems, um, and making those systems better, they can reduce between seventy and one hundred percent of contamination if you plant them in the right place. Um, and I should also say, natural flood management systems are not just about putting leaky dams in and scrapes and new ponds. It's also about placing good, placing well-designed woodlands in the landscape because a well-designed woodland will um, create interception. It will create hydraulic roughness and it will create um, the evapotranspiration later on and the infiltration of water through the roots. Um, we're looking at trying to make sure that there's adequate light reaching the water. So we look at, within woodland design, we look at creating 50% dappled shade at the riverside. We're looking at, provide, uh, of, uh, at trying to create natural features and habitats. Well, creating natural features doesn't sound quite right, but it's, it's replicating those natural features. So looking at ponds, riffles and gravel bars and wetlands where, where possible in in a woodland or surrounding the river. And having a vegetation that's appropriate to the site um, alongside the riverbed, the river banks rather. And also trying to create and, and recreate natural acidity and alkalinity. It's also important that there is organic matter in the river. So leaves and branches dropping into a river and staying in that river um, are a natural thing. But sometimes you know, in flood situations, those branches can, and whole trees, in fact, can get lifted up, taken downstream and cause a blockage somewhere down, down the line. So it's quite often that people will say, we don't want trees because they cause blockages. Well, that's because wood floats, you know. The rest of the blockages are just rumbling along the bottom of the of, of the riverbed, um, and um, but you you you'll see them as deposition of gravel, deposition of large stones, and deposition of um, of silt. During Storm Desmond in 2015, there were enormous amounts of gravel dropped onto farming onto farmers' fields and dropped into the centre of ta the centres of towns because. The streams have, had over um, overbreached and had, um, had just dropped the sediment as they slowed down. 
And in fact, that's what we're trying to get streams and rivers to do, but not in the places where it where it creates problems for infrastructure. Next slide, please. So how can woodland affect water quality? Um, WFD there means the Water Framework Directives. Um, water Framework was a European piece of legislation brought in in, 2000, in year 2000, um, in which, which looked to move um, European rivers and streams and um, water bodies towards a good ecological status. And woodland creation and good and effective woodland management, I should say, um, helps to protect soil and it reduces, therefore, the sediment delivery into the river. Um, you, it, it, by creating woodlands alongside streams and alongside other water bodies, um, you reduce the amount of fertiliser that you might put onto um, and, and pesticides that you might put onto the land. So therefore, you can in, you can reduce the amount of um, nutrient load in the in the water in the river. Woodlands intercept pollutant pathways. They also intercept stormwater pathways, and the hydraulic roughness caused by leaving land and allowing it to grow as woodland, um, and so therefore natural colonisation for read natural colonisation as well as um, woodland creation, but you can you can look to intercept those pollutant pathways. It'll also help with protecting riverbanks and increasing the channel diversity. Um, the root systems of trees will form a solid structure around which the riverbank um, can retain itself apart from in huge um, in areas of or where they're sorry where there is a um, a sudden flash flood maybe and um, the, the river's just not prepared and also of course um, a woodland around a river will help to create a microclimate next slide please Um, talked a little bit about uh, flood risk management, um, but here's some more. We can reduce flood risk by um, uh, placing woodlands in the right place in a catchment and, and therefore increasing evaporation. That's just the water that you see sometimes forming over woodlands that's naturally rising off as temperature increases. And slowing the rate of runoff on land by increasing soil infiltration. Um, picture there is, is actually of poached land by um, looks like cattle. Um, you can imagine that a soil that has had all the air gaps squished out of it is not um, as good as that allowing water to flow through it as a soil which is under a woodland, which has got plenty of roots and plenty of um, air within the, um, within the soil, which allows water to go, um, go through and filter through. And it's important, the filtering, because the filtering actually filters the excess nutrients in the first few years, but also then filters any nutrients that are coming through from stormwater runoff. And that slowing of water um, over, a, over a woodland um, is, is what we call increasing hydraulic roughness. That's really the, the grass and the, the understory that, that slows water, um, water down as it goes through. All of that reduces sediment delivery and, and siltation in the river. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to look at a um, simple case study, um, which is in a place uh, a place called Crompton Moor in Oldham, um, which is in Manchester, where I um, where I live. And this is carried out by um, the City of Trees, which is a community forest, and Manchester Metropolitan University. Essentially, they were looking at um, how cross slope tree planting 
can affect surface water runoff um, compared to uh, a millennia dom dominated landscape. And if you can, if you see the um, uh, the, the photo there, um, those different coloured um, rectangles are trial plots. Um, there are three replications of six surface surface cover types, different woodland types um, at different densities and different trees um, with um, sort of different um, management treatments to them. Um, there was a wider program of tree planting on the moor um, over a couple of hectares, 4,000 trees planted uh, in a riparian um, situation, which I'll show you later on, um, which was uh, going to, it was reckoned would um, by a uh, environment agency um, flood management specialist to hold back approximately a thousand um, cubic meters of water. Next slide, please. But as well as that, um, woodland creation and um, woodland test trials, there was a peatland restoration trial uh, up on Compton Moor, um, up above the woodland, so that you had, uh, up above the woodland creation, so that you had um, uh, a re-wetting and, um, uh, and sphagnum moss planting um, program, um, which would also help to slow down the flow and make woodland um, make the woodland uh, or, or make the make the land a, a, a little bit more um, able to be in it to intercept water. Um, I've just seen that, the, that some people are having problems seeing the slide. Has it moved on for everybody? Could somebody just raise a hand or shout? Can you see the Peatland restoration trial? Yeah. Yeah, some, sometimes yeah. it's a bit slower for some people. I don't know if Julia's okay. got a particularly slow um, connection. OK. I'll try and not worry. It's not my it's not my slide, not my slide um, moving forward process. So within this um, this process of the uh, the peatland restoration, um, they selected quadrats. Um, they were they they planted sphagnum moss. Um, and um, and then monitored and and actually you know sort of uh, there's a James Bond moss plant there 007 um, which you know sort of and uh, and over the course of a, a year or so those sphagnum moss um, clumps and it was clump grow it was clump forming sphagnum that um, that was planted had begin had begun to grow um, and the inference is that they were getting enough water to actually start to to make a difference. Um, Rewetting this this area um, and re-establishing um, sphagnum communities should make it more resilient to wildfires. What we found up in the moors, and I, uh, you know, it's probably the same around, um, you know, sort of where there are peat moor and um, and heathland around the West Midlands. Um, these are favoured areas for people to go out and have a barbecue uh, and leave their barbecue and set light to the rest of the moorland. In um, 2018 and 2019, we had some huge fires around Manchester um, that were visible from space. And um, what we did, what we have found in um, Few, in, in subsequent years, um, even though we were in lockdown in you know, sort of um, for most of 2020 and um, 21, uh, there were there were still fires, but where um, the National Trust and RSPB had taken action to re-wet the moorlands, um, those fires stopped at um, the wet areas and they were not that they didn't make as much damage. So there's a sign up on Crompton Moor, an interpretive sign saying what, what's been done and what the programme's all about. Next slide, please. Um, the engineered log jams, uh, there were four of them, no, sorry, five of them in, the, um, in this programme. And these were uh, situated along Old Brook, 
um, where there would be some further riparian planting. Um, the local authorities were were consulted to make sure that these were appropriate places and they weren't going to make a, a um, it, it's local authority land so they weren't going to make a um, an issue for local authorities in um, and the countryside unit for, for Oldham make, um, in um, having to maintain them. But um, those five log jams were installed over the 2019-2020 and hopefully um, when there are floods they store up to a thousand, a thousand meters cubed of, of water along with some of the moorland and the woodland creation um, that's, that's carried out as well. Next slide please. So you can hear, see here that the um, riparian planting was along that old brook and um, there's a little picture of it actually being done. It's not just uh, a, um, a, you know, a fantasy of red lines on a on a map uh, or an aerial photo. Um, and it it was reckoned that based on previous research undertaken by forest by forest research, um, this riparian woodland woodland creation would in, uh, reduce the water runoff by about thirty percent. And if you if you think about that in some of your areas, maybe, and think about how you might plant woodland alongside um, rivers in parks and the urban country parks, um, you might be able to reduce some of the surface water runoff that um, that ends up in the rivers going through your parks and the streams going through your parks. Next slide, please. Um, this is a picture of the engineered log jams. These are quite interesting um, constructions. Uh, normally, well, you can see there's a little um, conifer plantation by the um, just up above the digger there. The um, the cross pieces that you can see um, were all sourced from that plantation, which was sort of had a felling license on it so that so they were allowed to take them out but the interesting thing about these engineered log jams is that they also have willow weaved in between so um, they form a a living barrier after a while and they are managed so that the um, uh, the willow itself is woven together and forms a, a meshed barrier so that when the um, softwood, which is untreated, uh, ha has broken down and decayed and is no longer there, there is a living barrier there holding back water as well. Um, next slide, please. And you can see from the picture there that these barriers are actually becoming effective. Water is pooling behind um, them and in floods in, in flood situations that pool gets a, a lot larger before it um before it overtops or doesn't or, or starts to flow through the barrier like remembering that it is, it is a leaky barrier it's meant to just slow the water slow the water flow down uh, Manchester Metropolitan University was meant to start um monitoring in October but Covid is um meant that they're unable to do this but they still intend to um, and they will get students PhD and otherwise to um, go up and keep monitoring these um, the, the, the stations all along. The woodland creation plots have uh, very simple but effective um, mechanisms to look at runoff. Effectively it's a, um, a piece of drain pipe with a pot graduated at one end, which is which is slightly tilted, so that when the runoff comes through um, the uh, um, comes through the site, it gathers the volume of it gathers in a in the in the graduated pot. You can see how much has been um, 
how much has flown through compared to what was flowing the say that flowing through before and in the um in in the site which has um no action taken on it um there's a, an acknowledgement there from City of Trees and the support of Oldham Council. Always very important to get uh, local authority um, and the lead local flood authority in, involved. Um, Friends of Crompton Moor, I don't think this project would have been able to be done without community involvement. Um, and the funders, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, Forestry Commission and Moors for the Future and Man Manchester Met. And importantly, walking, walking with the wounded, which is a, um, a veterans um, society, a support society. Next slide, please. Just wanted to alert you to some other um, resources that are available um, with working with natural processes. The Environment Agency, as part of the write up of um, the interventions put in, the natural flood management um, interventions put in, in um, after the 2015 um, Storm Desmond, um, they produced some one page uh, documents which give you some, some um, clear guidance and some expectation management on the various different types of woodland creation in this instance that you can, you, that you can expect. Um, there are a whole host of different one page um, uh, one page examples and case studies. Next slide, please. Might be the end. No, it's not good. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, as well um, just mention the um, Woodland for Water project, um, which is a um, partnership project um, from the Rivers Trust, National Trust, Woodland Trust and the Beavers Trust. Uh, it's being supported by DEFRA through the Nature for Climate Fund um, and it's providing expert assistance in river catchments across England. The six catch point, um, pathfinder catchments are the Tor and the Torridge um, down in, uh, in Devon. The Tamar and the Foey, also in Foy, sorry, I should say, also in um, in Devon. The Burr, the Gaven, the Stiffkey, Wensum and Heacham and, and in Norfolk. Eden and Derwent in Cumbria, the Tame and the Wye and the Usk. So that is to increase riparian woodland planting um, through signposting people to the England Woodland Creation Offer, which is the um, the grant that's available for woodland creation in um, in England. That grant um, not only covers 100% of costs of creating woodlands from one hectare and above, but in the, in the instance of um, where you're planting woodlands for water, those one that those um, that one hectare can be made up of um, a number of smaller areas of woodland as long as the whole application reach, reaches a hectare. Um, sorry, I should say we're also looking across um, the National Trust estate uh, across the whole of England for opportunities to plant trees in, under this project. The UCO, as it's called, um, grant has um, additional payments uh, which are based around um, providing public benefit. Three of those are based around woodlands, uh, around water benefits, water quality, flood and riparian shade. Next slide, please. And that's the end. Thanks for listening. That's my um, email address if you'd like to ask questions afterwards that you don't want to ask now. Um, but thanks very much for listening. Fantastic, thank you very much, Chris. So um, if we can take questions, either people want to raise their hand if they've got something or in the chat, whichever, whichever suits really. Um, oh yes, so Alison just asked about a link to the slides, which is in the chat. So um, if people have 
can can see that there's a link there. There's actually a, I noticed when I was looking it up, there's a, there's a wider web page. It looks like it's got a hell of a lot of detail in there if people really do want it, <laughs> Chris. But um, that's the link. Yeah, the um, those, those guides that, or the documents. Yeah, the um, the the examples and case studies are um, on gov.uk. Um, you you just need to put in working with natural processes actually into a Google. Google search and it brings you straight to them. Um, the also on gov.uk is the um, the grant information okay. for the wood and creation offer. Uh, Liz, you've got a question. Sorry, I'll just take myself off mute. Um, yeah, I was really interested in the um, the moorland re-wetting that you talked about and how yeah. they go about it. Is it is it just blocking off drainage channels? Is that what they do? Yeah, in, in the main, Liz, it is. It's about that, but it's also about making scrapes and um, horseshoe shaped um, sort of divots, I suppose, in, um, in the moor to gather water on the surface of the moorland. Because what you're doing, if you're just blocking up the um, uh, the you know, drainage or um, natural streams, um, you're, you could possibly just be creating a further erosion issue. Yeah. Um, so it's really important to integrate with um, holding water on the surface of the peat to allow it to sink through and, and actually let the peat work as a sponge, um, which is naturally what it's what it's like. So yeah, it, it, it's a whole combination, and and though it's difficult, um, there are specialists like Moors for the Future who work in Derbyshire um, who can help, and they're always looking to expand their area of operations. Um, we, but we've yeah, got, we've got lowland heath, and we have tried rewetting through blocking of, of drainage channels and that seems to work reasonably well. Well, so well that the locals are up in arms that we've um, managed to re-wet one of the um, important footpaths. <laughs> that yeah, um, I, in, in, in some instances you have to be really, really careful where you put um, the drains or put the blocks in the drains um, and, and trying to site those so that they're not near um, near footpaths is, is <laughs> the problem. Um, but yeah, that sounds like it's been successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we want to do some more. But as you say, we'll try we'll try in uh, uh, more remote remote locations next time. The well, other yeah. thing I want, wanted to ask um, yeah. is uh, I at, with with my colleagues in Litchfield are looking at um, trying to get some private sector investment into um, biodiversity improvements at the moment um, through this latest DEFRA funding and um, flood alleviation opportunities haven't really um, sort of come up because mainly because I think our, our flood people are more interested because I work in a very very urban area they're more interested uh -huh. in flood alleviation within the town centres rather than in the sort of you know countryside areas so I was wondering if you knew of anybody in um, the sort of water um, yeah. bodies like uh, Environment Agency where I could go to to find out more information basically. Well the, yeah the Environment Agency have got some good um, uh, good stuff on their website. Um, I would I would also look for the Rivers Trust because they're very good. Some of them are um, more concentrating on uh, the ecology of rivers and the fishing, uh, you know, sort of fishing actually and angling. Um, but some do stretch further afield and think as, as at a wider catchment level. And it might be worth your while looking at the catchment based approach website to see whether there is any anybody in your area of Litchfield who could kind of who could help. It's good to talk to the catchment coordinator for the Environment Agency. They normally have a complete overview of everything that's going on in their catchment um, and can put, think, put their fingers on 
um, not only the right place to do something, but who's got some money to do what and whether they would be whether they would be interested in helping you as well. Um, the, the, there's also um, Natural England, obviously, who would be able to provide, potentially provide funding um, through their part of the Nature for Climate Fund, which is mostly looking at peat restoration, um, but is, um, but they are always worth talking to about seeing where the money where the next lot of money could come from i i would also think if you've got an innovative um way or you're thinking innovatively about how to get the money maybe look at the natural environment in, um, investment readiness fund which is coming up the That's second the one we're round applying week. for <laughs> sure. good i'm glad i put i i'm glad i said that as well then <laughs> <laughs> but because that, if you're thinking innovatively, um, can help you to um, to to sort of gear in money. Yeah, and lovely. Funds. All right. Thank you so much. And we've just got one question in the chat as well, Chris. So from Julia, okay. which is asking about the density of tree planting and, and what density you need to plant to make it. I, I assume when she says close, okay, so it could be proximity to the watercourse or actually density of planting itself. Both will have an impact, presumably. They will, yes. Um, uh, the the density is um, within the within the grant scheme. Our density says one thousand one hundred stems per hectare. Um, that sounds a lot, but actually that's what you would probably see at the start of any project that was looking to create a woodland that was for. Um, biodiversity reasons and birds and uh, and the like um, but in f in fact um, you can probably go down to between four and six hundred um, it's just that you might not get the um, the extra supplement for planting a riverside project at four to six hundred stems per hectare because the um, the design criteria is, has stipulated uh, 1,100. In previous grant schemes, we've said that riparian woodland, which I guess is where you're where you're talking, should be planted at 1,600 stems per hectare. But we've brought that down to 1,100 so that you can also claim the biodiversity um, additional payment, and okay. you're not separating yourself out from. Um, closeness to woodland or to rivers, um, that depends. If it's a main river, you have to ask permission from the Environment Agency if you're planting within eight metres of, um, of a main river, because they require access if there are flood defence um, issues along the riverside. Um, but the UK Forestry Standard gives um, appropriate buffering for the size of the river um, and it's not and, and um, off the top of my head I can't quite remember I should be able to but I can't um, but it depends on the size of the river um, the buffer zone is where you shouldn't do um, forestry operations it's not necessarily where you should where you shouldn't plant well it, and it isn't where you shouldn't plant trees it's where you might want to achieve that 50% dappled shade um, across the water. Okay. Does that help? I hope so. Um, Julia, I'm sure um, you feel free to put a follow up question in the chat for, for Chris. Yeah, Perhaps no, you can do that directly. That was, that so, was great. Thank, great. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. So we'll move on to another speaker now, but thank you for your time. Thanks for your presentation today. Cheers. So next, as I mentioned earlier, we've got Louise and I think Caroline as well, probably from uh, Natural England, who are going to talk to us about social or green social prescribing. So um, whoever, whichever one is first, over to you and then uh, just give me a, a nudge again when you want the slides moving on. Great, thank you very much. Um, hi everyone. So um, yes, myself, Louise and my colleague Caroline are here today. So um, I'm going to give the presentation and then um, myself and Caroline will take any questions that you might have um, afterwards. So I will make a start. So if I could have the first slide, please. 
Great. OK, so um, we're here to talk to you today about green social prescribing. So as the health lead, so myself in the West Midlands and um, Caroline in the East Midlands, our role is all focused around green social prescribing. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing some of you may know what social prescribing is, but I'll just give a little bit of um, background, a bit more information for you. Um, social prescribing. So it has been around for a number of years, um, but in sort of different formats. Um, but it's only very recently that the NHS has sort of thrown its um, thrown its weight behind it and says we're going to back this. This is the way that we um, we're going to deliver things moving forward. Um, so it's a key component of a new the new NHS universal personalised care model. So this care model is there. Um, its aim is to help a range of people with long term health conditions and complex needs um, and those specifically people struggling with or managing mental health issues or struggling with social issues and um, which affect their health and well-being. Um, so the aim is to help them to make decisions about managing their own health um, and based on what matters to them. So the whole idea of the NHS universal personalised care is that it's a response to a uh, this is in response to a one size fits all health and care system that now cannot meet the increasing needs of um, and complexity of people's needs and expectations. Um, so the evidence showing that people have better experiences and improved health and well-being if they can shape their care and support. Um, so social prescribing is a big part of this and it, it is because it recognises that individual health is determined by a range of social, environmental and economic factors. And it allows and enables people to take control of their own health. So how it works, um, although there's various models employed throughout the country, it typically works whereby a health professional, also known as a link worker or a health connector or um, health educator, um, works with individuals on a one to one basis to connect them to activities that may improve their health and well-being. The aim is they're working with individuals who um, might continually or frequently access GP um, services or wider NHS services um, when they don't have a acute medical need. There is a social need that needs addressing. So rather than them using the NHS resource, they will meet with a link worker who will take the time to sit with them as an individual and find out um, how they can, what sort of things they need help and support with. And then that link worker will connect them to a range of activities to help. Um, typically, the range of activities they'll connect them to will be delivered by um, voluntary and community sector organisations. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I think this is a nice sort of infographic or um, visual to better explain social prescribing. So as I said, it's all about addressing people's needs in a holistic way. Um, so we have a link worker who spends that time with that individual. It allows the individual to really take control of their own health. Um, and that link worker will then connect them to a range of activities, whether that be um, through the through physical activity, the natural environment, through um, money and um, financial support or through arts and culture. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and just some headlines about social prescribing. So I think it's quite a buzzword at the moment. It seems to be about everywhere and it's everyone seems to be getting involved. And I think it's really um, good to know sort of what the emerging evidence is saying. Um, so the research evidence suggests that 20% of GP appointments at the moment are about wider social needs and not necessarily about a medical issue that can be treated by a GP, a prescription or an NHS service. And following on from that, the National Health Alliance suggests that 30% of people who do access a healthcare service, whether that's in a GP setting or a hospital setting or in a community, it is again for a non-medical need, so quite high there. Um, and then 59% of GPs do think that social prescribing um, can reduce their workload. So as I said, it's been around for quite a while now, social prescribing, but in different forms. And uh, there was a huge, a couple of studies that have been carried out, um, but a, a study in Bristol that's carried out over a number of years. And um, the emerging evidence from that suggests that a social prescribing model or social prescriptions can lead to a range of positive health and well-being outcomes and more importantly I suppose well more importantly alongside this is a reduction in GP consultations so they found that over a I think it was a six month period of time there's a 40% reduction in GP consultations um, which is um, obviously one of the, the aims of, of it. 
Um, they have some figures as well that the NHS have committed to. So um, they were looking to have a thousand link workers in post by the end of last year and four and a half thousand by 2023, um, which means that over 900,000 people would have been referred through a social prescribing pathway um, last year and two and a half million by 2024. So there's a real commitment to, um, to make this work. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, why green social prescribing? So we're going to look at uh, more specifically where we come in. Um, so we all know that being outside and being in nature is good for you. So we know that being outdoors um, reduces stress. We know specifically spending time in nature decreases anxiety, <coughs> feelings of anxiety, depression, and it boosts self-esteem. And it also reduces mental fatigue as well. <coughs> Following on from this, we also know that um, exercising outdoors um, or exercising in nature increases our mental performance and concentration skills as well. Uh, next slide, please. And specifically looking at how uh, nature or being outdoors can address health issues. So when we're looking at physical health, so we all know um, exercise, it helps reduce the, the risk of um obesity, diabetes, helps um, manage arthritis, reduce risk of heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and exercising outdoors is only going to, to help that. Um, mental health, so again, some of the um, benefits that I mentioned out um, previously, but also there's a lot of benefits around social interaction and reducing socialization um, when taking part in activities um, with other people. And then finally, um, around older adults as well. So we know the evidence and research suggests that older adults who engage with nature, connect with nature, take, um, take part in activities outdoors, it reduces cognitive decline, um, reduce, improves memory function, reduces the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, but also with a confirmed diagnosis also slows the progression of the disease as well, which is really encouraging. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so green social prescribing. So in essence, green social prescribing is the practice of engaging individuals in nature based interventions in the natural environment. So we're looking at any sort of activities that an individual can do that take place outdoors in a natural environment anywhere from this could include from um, a local park to a national nature reserve to a woodland or even blue social prescribing which takes place around water. Uh, so over the next couple of slides, we've just got some examples of activities, um, which I'm sure you're probably very familiar with. So park runs, looking for health schemes and health walks, social farms and gardens, so it's like the urban farms, care farming as well. A green gym, which I guess some of you will know too. And finally, forest school. So there's just a few examples of some of the activities. So um, how could green social prescribing work um, in your park or your green space? So um, we know that um, delivering these activities provides lots and lots of benefits. But in terms of provide for a green space or for a, 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 a park, it's increasing the number of activities available. So um, putting a real diverse range of activities, which will then increase and diversify the range of audience that will access the park or the green space. Uh, so we know everything from a forest school will target sort of families with young children all the way up to a health walk, which will typically target those who are maybe retired and um, so it provides a real range um, as well but also there's activities that can really target specific communities as well um, so we know there are activities that are delivered by people um, with English uh, with in different languages or targeting specific communities um, women, BAME communities etc and um, dementia walks exact as well which work really really well. But we also know and um, evidence suggests that people who take part in activities outdoors or in green spaces, it improves their engagement with that space. Um, so we know that they are more likely then to um, engage with the space and want to use the space, I'd say appropriately if that's the right way of putting it so we know that they're more interested in that and um, but also um, these activities provide a range of outcomes as well so not only will it help with community engagement but also um, reducing health inequalities in the area and addressing um, local health needs as well and uh, next slide please 
Thank you. Um, so now specifically, so um, how me and Caroline can support. Um, so it might be that you're sitting there thinking, oh, I've got some activities going on, um, but I'd like some help with them. Or no, I don't do things at the moment, but I'd be quite interested in maybe um, looking at how I could put some activities on or increase provision. And um, so what we could do at Natural England, so we can link you to organisations who can support you with that. So if you're interested in maybe having health walks or um, care farming or anything like that at your at your space, we can connect you and help you to to start that. But as well, we can connect you to link workers and healthcare professionals who can provide that valuable source of referrals into these activities. So whether you have an activity going on at the moment and you're quite keen to increase referrals into that or, you know, tell more people about it or have more people access it or you want to start something and need to get the word out, we can help you connect with the, uh, the people who can do that for you. We can also connect you to peer to peer support so other um, parks or green spaces who might be doing similar work um, we all know we it's good to connect isn't it and learn from others so we can do that for you um, we can provide very 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 limited support around funding and um, so we can signpost you to um, funding that's available and um, that's pretty much it where we can go with the funding unfortunately but we can sort of um, signpost you to that and then we can also connect you to other Natural England work. I think you've had speakers in the past from other areas of Natural England, but if it's something that you're interested in, um, we also can connect you to our inclusion officers, our teams who work around the Nature Recovery Network, obviously Biodiversity Net Gain and our NNRT, our National Nature Reserve teams as well. Uh, next slide, please. And that's it. So thank you very much. And uh, me and Caroline, happy to take any questions. I did just see one pop up in the chat, but um, and here's our contact details as well. So there's myself and my colleague who work across the West Midlands. So and then Caroline in the East. So please feel free to take our email addresses if you want to um, to get in touch with us. Great, brilliant. Thank you, Louise. So um, I think Gemma's probably asked the question that everybody's wondering. So I, I know there's obviously these pilots across the country. I guess what happens if you're not in an area where there's a pilot and there's funding already? Uh, so yeah, so if there's no staff to support the activities. Yes, effectively, yeah. Yeah, we we do come across this quite um, a lot. It, it's quite frequently. It's probably the biggest challenge with regards to the activities. There's there's a few things that we can do to help. I mean, there's funding available in some aspects which can be used to um, for to upskill staff that to de deliver or to um, work on recruiting volunteers etc um, and there's specific funding then that you if you do recruit volunteers you can offer them training etc to deliver um, but it is it is the most difficult thing and I think it's about understanding what it is that what the activity is and then we can work more and signpost people to to where we can help. Okay. Right. It's um it's a very good question and all I can yeah. say is that we've been feeding this back <laughs> um to managers because it is it is essential that you know we do need to in, in order to move forwards in any at any speed we do need to find more funding to directly go on the ground um and there's a lot of research being done and there's a lot of good ideas out there but um Having come from a delivery background myself um, on nature reserves, I totally agree. It's an excellent question and we will add it to the list of questions to feedback as well. Okay. And just in terms of those pilots that are happening around the country, what they run most of them until early 2023, is that right? And what do you expect the picture to be for green social prescribing after that? You know, it, I guess you said yourself, it's something that's got, uh, that's grown and is growing. I guess we in the green space sector and you and you know in the um, health sector have known for years that health and well-being you know massive benefits come from green space but why is it taking so long to catch on and if we're still in a pilot stage in some areas? Caroline John to answer? Or <laughs> is that, sorry is that? <laughs> um, I, I the truth is they have to all I know is that um, I mean I've asked the same question so uh, um, I think the fact is they have to have the evidence there all the time you know to in order the, the idea is that they they have to prove that these from these pilots it has to go back to government and they in natural England has to prove that this is this is the way forward it we do, do want to roll it out I have heard 
rumours that there aren't going to be any more pilots after this. The idea is that this will then be rolled out and that hopefully there will be more funding to roll it out across the country. But I can't really say, I can't say for sure, but that's, um, I think it's just a process. Um, it's a it's a bit of a slow process, but um, but that's the process that we're in at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not yeah. ideal for answer. I know it's not an ideal answer. I come from a voluntary conservation background myself, so I understand exactly where 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 people are coming from. But I think it's just they have to prove they have to prove that these pilots are really going to work in order to get more money put to that area of uh, into that area of work. Is that OK, Louise? Yeah, and I think um, just following on, I think um, did you mention something about how we know why is it now we know that it's important to access green space? Is that well? I was thinking that we, you know, well, lots of people in the green space sector certainly, and obviously in other sectors, have known that for years. You know, we're harking back to the reason public parks were created in the first place, and all of that kind of conversation, and it seems to be coming full circle, don't we? So. I, I can never quite understand these things why it takes so long other than Caroline's point about you've got to prove it with proper evidence to justify the funding ultimately yeah. that's why they take ages to get these things have to you know start somewhere <laughs> yeah and I think um, with the seven pilots that are um, being delivered around the country um, it's all come out from COVID-19 so COVID-19 highlighted that access to green space really helps people's mental mm -hmm. health and that's where that's all come from Um, obviously prior to that you know people are, more people are accessing it and that's where that's mm. why I think it's taken off. Okay. Uh, Richard you've got a question you've put a bit of a potentially controversial. Well, I stuck a rant in the chat but that to be, <laughs> but to be honest that I don't know I've always found that just it's just the term social prescribing is tricky because I think it's it, it sounds it sounds like something it's sort of not and I think that's fine it's just a personal bugbear of mine and it's been like it for a long time so again but anyway I was more going to talk about um I think it was uh, some of the experience we've had in Leicestershire um doing a small piece of work with colleagues in public health which I know James is part of at Braggart um which was working with some of the social prescribers to try and create a um essentially a directory of opportunities for uh, social prescribers to be able to refer people towards. So kind of I think what we were conscious of and it sort of alludes to some stuff that Gemma's talking about in the chat is that there was a bit of a risk that as providers we would have people being signposted towards us potentially with some quite complex needs mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody from the social prescribers through to the teams on the ground kind of knew who could accommodate what and kind of I suppose building some of that trust between social providers uh, social prescribers and the providers on the ground that we 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 kind of knew what the offer would be like um so we were really in interested and excited by some of the proposals that the social prescribers thought they would have in terms of individuals they might that they might have coming through the system and we felt that if we could build that link through to them and some of the parks managers or you know bragger or some of my senior rangers to go actually this social prescriber i really trust them therefore it's worth me taking this person there they're suggesting comes and works with me because we've built up that relationship and things like that so we've produced this resource which is on um the active leicestershire website um and social prescribers are being uh, asked to use it and things like that um interestingly it's had quite a lot of hits but very little use by social prescribers um and I think we're, what we're what we're kind of discovering it seems from the feedback is that at the moment some of the need within the NHS is so acute that um you a lot of the work social prescribers are doing is at kind of a more well a more acute level than perhaps as people who would necessarily be signposted towards green spaces but it's still something we, we're, we're developing and hopefully we'll see some good results um in the next few months so we're kind of continuing to monitor and evaluate it alongside our colleagues in public health so right. yeah it was just a comment really louise can anything you wanted to say in response to that or i know we've been told about social prescribers and and um well the whole everything's been um diverted because of all the vaccination program and a whole lot of things that would have happened a year ago didn't happen so we i know we keep being fed back that information that things you know will be changing but people have been diverted all over the place so the system and the the way of linking through has not been working as it was planned but that's just what we're hearing i think and over to you louise if there's something else and uh, no i think that yeah that's what caroline said and i think the other issue to bear in mind is that um 
you know you were saying that link workers refer in people who aren't suitable and I think that's also the fact that link workers get put referred people to them who aren't suitable as well and I think it's that whole cycle of sort of you know it's very new still social prescribing and because of Covid and the vaccinations that they haven't really been able to focus on guessing what they needed to and I think it's just going to take time to work out and this is where mine and Caroline's roles um, working with the National Academy of Social Prescribing to really sort of address it and ha in, you know how can we get it working. Mm. Yeah, no, fair enough. It's good. Uh, Liz, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to say, obviously, a few of you uh, on the call know that uh, Walsall is part funded by by public health. And so um, a lot of our staff are very focused on um, delivery of public health outcomes. So, um, you know, we've been trying to develop those relationships with with the social prescribing teams and making sure that you know there's mutual trust between the individuals the social prescribers and they know what we deliver and they know they can trust us to deliver good quality stuff so um it'll be useful uh, louise if i touch base with you at some point in the future about some of the work that we've been doing yeah that sounds great and just picking up finally, I think probably on one comment in the chat from Charlie from Nottingham about, um, which is a good question actually. I mean, she's suggested about putting it in financial terms, the return. So for example, actually, you know, the hours that could potentially be put into green space in a productive way to the green space, I suppose, as well as productive to the to the people themselves. Is that being valued as part of this, uh, any of these projects at all? Or is it purely focused on the benefit to the individual? It's, uh, um, oh. <laughs> sorry, Caroline. <laughs> um, I, I would I would hope that it is going. It's a two way thing and that this whole because we're working for Natural England uh, and uh, as Natural England employees, I would hope very much that it is a two way thing and that we're trying to um, help people's mental and physical health at the same time, helping promote and show the importance of um, of natural of the natural environment and the importance of these green spaces um, and depending on what type of green space it is as well obviously that varies a lot but uh, you know um, depending on the biodiversity and everything but that definitely you know that that aspect should link in so it should be a two-way a two-way thing helping people and helping the natural environment that's you know, I think that's the difference between um, we're working alongside NASPA, National Academy for Social Prescribing, and we're supposed to be uh, supposed to be we're coordinating like the green side, whereas a Sport England on the Arts Council. So we are really supposed to be promoting that side and and, um, the you know, showing the importance of those green spaces and the work of the green providers. So one quick project, I'll just tell you about some in some work in Worcestershire. So I'm working with uh, Wire Forest um, so, um, to work with how we can use social prescribing to encourage volunteers to do some conservation work around the, um, the wire. Um, so we are funding for link workers to trial this activity themselves and um, to go out and see what the volunteering involves with the hope then that they will be able to refer their patients into that group and um, so the forest are also able to fund things like workwear for any individuals who are interested so the social prescription works because that individual is referred from the link worker to the wire but actually they're joining a conservation volunteer group and they're going to commit to that um, so the trial is taking place next well sort of end of February early March and what we're hoping is then there'll be an influx of volunteers um, to the wire um, obviously it's costing us that funding to initially do it but if it, if we're gaining volunteers then it works so you know if it's something that I'm really keen to to replicate so if anyone is interested and would like to talk about that more um, or would like to replicate it let me know and we right. can do that. Yeah that's really useful and I think you know the conversation that Charlie and Gemma started in the chat about having someone to coordinate them is obviously really key but certainly you know some of the examples where there's great volunteering going on the the sheer number of hours that those volunteers are able to put back in more than you know demonstrates the value of having the, the coordinator in the first place so let alone if you've then got all the benefits to the individuals as well on top of that so yeah, yeah. brilliant great thank you very much for your time both that's really good let's just thank hope you. it becomes um the norm you know after these pilots really and can spread across country I suppose.
Okay, so the last bit of our agenda today is this roundtable discussion uh, on biodiversity credits and biodiversity net gain. So uh, I think we've just got the one slide on this. So over to you really, Richard, if you want to just elaborate on your input. And then I think Rebecca from Worcestershire is going to chip in as well. So over to you both really. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I don't really have a huge amount to, to sort of add in here. I suppose I'm I'm interested. I know we, we talked a bit about this um, quite a number of meetings ago in a webinar uh, with some of the work that was been doing being done in uh, Warwickshire on some of their biodiversity credits work and some of that, that sort of uh, work. And I, I was kind of interested to reflect on how that's changed over the past year or so and who else is starting to get inquiries from developers or organizations like Network Rail, High Res England, that sort of thing about offsetting projects on their sites. Um, kind of interested to see what sort of inquiries people are getting, uh, how they're handling, if they're handling them at all or whether you're just sort of batting them away at the moment, um, who you're working with for advice and support on some of these projects and then kind of any challenges or opportunities that we think are coming out of um, some of this. So I suppose kind of to give a bit of background, some of the um, situations we're having is we've, we've had a number of inquiries from uh, organisations about whether we would have suitable sites that could be used for um, some form of off-site um, offsetting and uh, use of um, biodiversity credits from developments um, and we're kind of exploring what schemes might look like and things like that but I'm kind of aware that the, the system is quite up in the air at the moment um, so be interested to explore what other people are doing if anything. Okay thanks Richard. Um, Rebecca is that a good chance point for you to come in and just explain what's going on in Worcestershire? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just introduce myself. So I work for Worcestershire County Council. Um, I sit within the ecology team and the strategic planning unit. Um, the the NERF funding, um, Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund, has been mentioned a couple of times. So we received a grant, um, the first round of the funding um, at the end of last year. And um, the project that we sort of put forward was essentially to get Worcestershire biodiversity net gain ready. So the County Council um, put in a, an application with, with the South Worcestershire Councils, which over the Malvern Hills, um, to, to work together um, to sort of look at, you know, what we needed to do essentially to get ourselves ready to deliver the biodiversity net gain mandate. And we're um, then engaging with the, the, the districts in the north of the county as well, giving them the opportunity to sort of um, engage and opt into all of this. So we're at um, early stages, I will say, we're only just sort of starting to get into the, the meat of the project really so I'm very interested to, to hear what you guys have got to say in answer to um, um, Richard's questions because I think um, there's going to be a lot of common themes from local authorities across the county you know it's, it's going to be a very much cross-border thing so I'm happy to chip in um, with sort of my experience so far um, to people's questions and stuff but yeah very interested just to, to get involved in the discussion. Um, and Ian's put an exit in the chat. So Ian, you've you've come across a 